There's a class of paintings that museum goers pass by without a second glance that painters consider a feast for the eyes. These are painters' paintings. Today I want to talk about uh, a painter's painting in the Cleveland Museum, a painting titled A Young Woman by the Dutch painter Gerard Doe. Gerard Doe lived in the 17th century, the Dutch Golden Age, the age of Rubens and Rembrandt. I recently did a video on David Tenyers, his almost exact contemporary. And Doe is probably most remembered for being a student of Rembrandt's. In this self-portrait, you can see uh, some of Rembrandt's stylistic touches, uh, though you can also see something that uh, is completely Doe's own, which is this kind of trompe l'oeil uh, effect with the curtain in the front of the front of Doe, uh, as if to say the this is an actual window and you can open the window and see the painting. Doe was um, a member of a, a, a group of Dutch painters that were known known for this approach. I don't want to linger too much uh, over Doe's uh, subsequent career. He became the leader or a member of a group of artists uh, in Leiden, and they were called the Leiden Fine Painters. And they were um, trompe l'oeil painters. Uh, trompe l'oeil means um, super realistic. They were um, interested in the uh, effects of light on objects, uh, reflections, textures, and those kind of things. Um, in this painting titled uh, Woman Chopping Onions, you can see the picture in the front is rendered with a lot of care. And um, here you can see the, uh, the way the, the woman's portrait is rendered is very tight and fine. I, in, my, in my view, this is over, uh, over refinement. It's kind of off-putting to me and not representative of the painting I want to talk about today, but this is probably more representative of Doe's mature style than uh, the painting at the Cleveland Museum. A few other things to notice about this painting is the um, a, lo a lot of um, painters who are into uh, super realistic approaches tend to have certain themes they're, they're comfortable with. And I think we get a sense of that here with Doe, even though the... Um, the the woman's portrait is rendered with uh, uh, great conviction in many respects. The child's painting is uh, kind of goofy to me, and I suspect that um, the uh, he had trouble uh, getting his model to pose. Maybe it's his son or a house member. I think the model for the woman is probably uh, a family member. I don't think this was a commissioned painting. I could be wrong about that, though. But anyway, to me, there's a psychological problem sometimes for these Trump oil painters. They can uh, have no problem painting uh, still lifes or what have you. But when it comes to uh, the human form, they're off put or uncomfortable with um, with that. The psychology of it is makes them uncomfortable and gets them off the game. I think, for example, uh, Suzanne was probably the same way. The first thing to note about the Cleveland painting is the small size of the painting. It's 12 inches by 13 inches. Now think about that for a moment and, and fix that in your mind about just how small that is. It's essentially the um, size of a notebook. So this painting doesn't quite veer into the miniature category, but it is very, um, very small. In addition, the area for the portrait is further restricted by an oval frame. This is not painted Trump oil style. It's, it's pretty it's sketched in. This device is uh, found in all kinds of schools. It's not, it's not just Trump oil. So even though this painting was done when Doe was 25 and um, most likely had not been a student of uh, Rembrandt for some time, you can still see Rembrandt's influence. The handling is very similar to his master's. The tones, of course, are um, restricted to Rembrandt's palette, somber tones, earth colors, flesh colors, probably ochre, little uh, what we call today um, English red. But it, it's, it's his master's palette. Before we start examining the painting in Cleveland more closely, take a moment to talk about um, museum websites. Um, in general, 
I find museum sites to be pretty bad. Uh, obviously, the museum staffs are not technical people, and they probably hire um, consultants, designers, um, who, of course, tell them they need sites that are very interactive and heavy on graphics. And um, as a consequence, a lot of the sites are very poorly, uh, very poor performers. The information is, even though um, wonderfully presented, very uh, unuser friendly, hard to, hard to find. The worst thing uh, we see is a lot of times the the websites have no direction, which of course is true of all businesses often, but um, for museums, it's especially uh, I think egregious. Or the direction they take, uh, they're sort of the fallback position is let's talk about ourselves. And uh, as wonderful, I'm sure, as people who run uh, some of the museums I'm thinking about are, uh, I'd rather be able to study the collection. Cleveland is an exception to this. Their website has uh, gotten uh, better. Uh, it's um, thorough. Uh, I think their entire collection is online. And it's very uh, performs very well, and they have a wonderful interactive app, which we'll I'll demonstrate here, um, where you can really zoom in on their paintings, and it's just uh, um, it's not like being there, of course, but it's next best thing. You know, Cleveland gets a bad rap, and the museum is actually in the top five in the country. I, as you probably know, I'm a heavy museum visitor, and I can speak with some authority. Uh, on this. I mean, uh, I am not the authority, of course, but I've been to um, a lot of museums. And I've put, as I said, Cleveland in the top five. I think New York and Washington, Philly and Chicago are certainly ahead of it, but nothing else really. Um, so Cleveland really has a great museum. And the um, Asian collection is preeminent in the country, or it was. Maybe, you know, things have changed recently, but it's. They have a tremendous collection. Cleveland gets a bad rap, unfairly. I think uh, it's a great place uh, in the summertime. It's on the it's on the water. Summers are cool. Anyway, that's enough of this uh, little diversion. A young woman is on wood and is in perfect condition. There's no blemishes, cracks, fading. That's the case for nearly all of the uh, paintings from the Dutch Golden Age. Those boys, they could paint. They were they were craftsmen. Zooming into this detail here, you can see this is sort of uh, in the kitchen kind of thing that uh, artists like to to see to examine these things and and get to the get to the process where the the paintings were created. The area where her bonnet is is most likely the ground, which is the color that the artist puts on the the canvas or the panel. Uh, before they start painting. And usually the color or the tone of the ground is uh, a neutral. So you can add both lights and darks to the neutral ground. Here you can see the streakiness, and that's common. The streakiness was desirable um, for the Flemish and Dutch painters. It kind of broke up the surface a little bit and gave it a little more character, which they like. Let's zoom back out and... Um, Look at the, the face a little more. It's very full of life and, to coin a phrase, realistic. Now, compare this treatment, which is kind of free and loose, to the controlled tight treatment, the painting we saw earlier of a woman chopping onions. This painting doesn't have any of that uh, over-refinement, yet it's very lively and, in my view, it's much more fresh. And keep in mind how small this painting is. Looking at this detail, a couple things jump out. One, the hair is painted freely. It's, uh, you could almost uh, call it impressionistic. There's no, the artist is going for something that gives the effect or the impression of hair. And then um, the other thing, if you think about it, to see the ground through the painting, the finished painting, in the case of painting has to be painted thinly, at least in part. And I think uh, this is true for all the Dutch painters um, that I'm aware of. They, if you're going to have a, a ground, a tone ground, uh, you're going to use it, and that means it's going to come through some parts of the painting. And I think this is 
for admirers of Rembrandt, they they get focused on the impasta, the thick paint that he uses. But of course, he was a, a master of uh, emphasizing certain things, the darkness of his backgrounds, emphasized the light. It was said of him he could paint out a whole painting just to highlight a single pearl. And so somebody who's doing that cannot paint everything uniformly thick. It was, most of the painting is painted thin. I think I've seen um, people imitating Rembrandt's paintings and they, and they just get this wrong. His paintings are mostly thin or maybe several thin passages, one over another, that's common, and then punctuated with uh, sort of dramatic impasto. Something else uh, I think that's important to point out, especially if you're not a painter um, and you don't think about these things too much, but looking at this detail of the uh, frame, the old frame in the left-hand corner, you can see the brush strokes in the gray area that, that comprises the frame. And that um, tells me that the paint is very um, thin. Um, <clears throat> oil paint, for those of you who haven't uh, used it much, is very thick, viscous, and um, you need to thin it to, to a degree to make it usable. But if you thin it too much, then it becomes uh, a runny mess. Um, but when you examine the paintings of the Dutch painters, you see this kind of liquid, fluid oil paint that's um, similar to tempera in many respects, which means it's very thin but retains its body. And uh, how you achieve that with oil paint is uh, was um, closely guarded secrets for some painters and some studios and shops. But here we see evidence all over, and as we do, as I said, in all the, the Dutch paintings that I've examined, it's um, very fluid paint. So let's examine the painting a little more closely now. The, what strikes the eye most is um, how freely, not loosely, but how freely the artist painted, and how lively the painting is. It's just bursting with life. And as we zoom in and look at the details, you notice that um, contrary to what you might think looking at, a, looking at this painting from say 15 feet away, there's no blending really. The tones are laid uh, close to one another and uh, there's uh, very little uh, worry about trying to smooth out transitions. So how, how does this loose approach uh, or free approach um, produce such lifelike results? Well, first of all, the drawing is, is, is very good. In other words, um, you can think about the design of it, uh, even a cartoon, a cartoon or a caricature can capture something about the subject and uh, it's, it's very um, briefly done. Uh, but everything's in the right place, and it, it just just with that little bit, you convey uh, you convey the spirit of the subject. So we, that's that's the starting point. Secondly, the one of the important keys here is that the painter has paid attention to the over under. Things closer to the eye are painted above things further away, and this kind of um, modeling, if you want to call it that. It's like I said, it's not blending. There's a, there's a sharp distinction between blending and modeling. And this modeling is what gives it its firmness and uh, life in, uh, to a great extent. And then the other part, uh, the third part, is the uncanny ability to put two tones together uh, that belong there. So the eye blends them. Um, uh, for the painter and it creates the transitions and um, and all the blending is done in the eye and uh, this takes a, a keen eye and a lot of practice. The last thing I want to talk about is the hatched brush strokes you see throughout the painting. Tones are put down in um, a series of parallel lines and um, that's uh, these aren't one-offs. Um, there's many passages in this painting that you can see see this that demonstrate this. Uh, 
And this is typical of the paintings of the Dutch Golden Age, and uh, especially for Rembrandt and uh, his students. You can see this example of a Rembrandt etching. You can see the, the same kind of treatment, the, the parallel lines and then the hatchings. And um, you might say, well, uh, that was a treatment reserved for pen and ink or uh, etching and engraving. Uh, but here's an example of uh, a charcoal drawing where he demonstrates the same hatching as well. And um, if you think about it, this um, think about engravings, think about a dollar bill, the same kind of parallel lines to find the form. <clears throat> and that was just the way um, artists were taught to draw. And so it was very natural. And uh, so you see it in this painting. And the hatching, you might think as you zoomed in here that it's... Uh, strange or bizarre or no it actually uh, follows the form um, and enlivens uh, enlivens the painting it's true that um, in his later career or you might want to call it uh, his mature style doe drifted away from this I suspect it was a it was a way a strategy for him and his um, lead and fine painters to uh, distance themselves from Rembrandt and set themselves up on um, their own style. Although I've only scratched the surface of this uh, delightful painting by Gerard Doe in the Cleveland Museum of Art, I think I'll stop here. My voice is uh, starting to get a little rough, uh, which is always a sign that I act too much. See you next time.